Welcome to another episode of Let's Talk Micro. And I, I just want to start uh, by thanking you all for listening to the last episode, um, episode zero, an introduction. You know, I am so happy to be here talking to all of you, uh, to once again, you know, be sharing my knowledge, my passion. You know, they they have no affiliation. They're they're not they're not sponsoring this podcast. You know, I just think it's a it's a great reference book. So I'll be using it. And so last week, you know, we talked about the role of technologists or medical lab scientists and what we do and how that work impacts healthcare. You know, like I mentioned, you have an infection, you have a cut, etc. And you go to a clinical, you go to a hospital, right? So what does the doctor do? He collects a sample. And then that sample is sent to the lab. And here's where we come in. You know, what we what do we do with it? Right? So the doctor orders a culture. And like the word says, you know, we are cultivating the sample. We are trying to see if something grows out of it. And in this media, you know, or agar, there are nutrients that the organisms need to grow. You know, just like us. You know, we need food. So they need food also. You know, they need some nutrients. And there are several types of media. Right? So on this podcast, I am focusing on media for bacterial cultures. Normally, the media is classified based on its functions and what it contains. So, and this here's where we get a little technical. So, in, basically, in bacteriology, we have four categories of media. We have enriched media, which has specific nutrients required for um, certain pathogens. You know, a great example, you have like a limb broth, which we use it for the recovery of group B strep. We have nutritive media, which contains nutrients that support growth of most organisms. So basically, it just it grows pretty much everything. And a great example of this um, media is blood agar, right? Uh, every student in basic micro, when you get started in the lab, you work with blood agar, right? So when I'm talking about blood agar, everyone knows what I'm saying, basically, right? Um, it has like sheep red blood cells, um, and it is definitely one of the main agars that we use in cultures. Um, I will say that almost every culture panel includes blood agar. And then uh, we also have selective agar, and we have differential agar. And selective agar, it's just, you know, it has one or more agents that inhibit the growth of certain organisms while selecting others. You know, that's just what it is. Two classic examples that we have, you know, we have PEA and we have McConkie, right? McConkie has those bile salts that inhibit the growth of gram-positive organisms. So it selects for gram-negative rods. And another great example of selective agar is PEA, uh, phenyl ethyl alcohol agar. So it is used for the selection of aerobic gram positive cocci and bacilli. So that is not to say that other organisms will grow, but maybe somewhere down the line we'll talk about that. But these are two great examples. They are included on your basic battery of cultures. And I will talk more about this. Um, but definitely data on blood, PEA, McConkie. And, you know, here's for your students out there. Here's where you have to be careful. You have to be as specific as you, you know, as you have to, um, as you can be when you're describing, you know, the purpose of this auger. You know, these are very typical questions that get asked. Maybe if you're doing a clinical rotation at a hospital, if you're taking a micro class. So for in what I mean, for example, if I give you a test and I say, what kind of media is McConkie, right? And your answer is select it, you know, selects for gram negative. Okay. So gram negative one, you see, by leaving it out like that, you are telling me that I can go ahead and uh, I can put a, let's say, a bacteroides on McConkie. 
I can put um, an Isiria gonorrhea, a Pastorella, a Haemophilus, and it will actually grow. Um, and as you know, that's not true. And maybe some of you out there, some um, micro enthusiasts are saying, well, if I put a Pastorella erogenes, it will grow. And for that, you will be right. But overall, the other pastorellas, like Pastorella canis, uh, Pastorella multicida, they're not going to grow on McConkie. Pastorella erogenes is an exception. And I have a great story about Pastorella erogenes. And so this happened a few years ago. I was working in bacteriology. And normally when you start seeing pastorellas, you know, you get um, you know, your classics. Canis and multicida so and what's pastorella it's a like gram negative cockle bacilli um that is normal flora in animals you know multicida can be fl normal flora in cats and dogs uh canis is for dogs and there's another pastorella which is pastorella erogenes so i worked this culture you know and this was before the Molditov days, for those of you that know the Molditov, you know, you get an ID really quick. Um, my hospital at that time didn't have one. So we were still doing the Vitek. So I go ahead and I'm working my gram-negative rod. And it's growing on Mac. I set up a Vitek. And then the next day, you know, I mean, this is the wound bench. There's not a 24 hour read, so basically you work it up and then the next day you find out what it is. Erogenes. So I, I'm like, what? You know, like pastorella erogenes? Um, you know, I was a little surprised, you know, pastorella not gro growing on Mac. So here is where I go to another great resource that has no affiliation to this podcast. Um, I go to an ASM book, American Society of Microbiology. You know, they actually establish the procedures on how to, you know, what media we use, how to properly work up the cultures, basically what we need to rule out on a particular source. And as I look information on this organism, I look pastoral erogenes. Um, it grows on MAC, you know, gram negative, cocobacilli, biochemicals match and everything. And it says it is normal flora in pigs. So it is caused by pig bites. So I go ahead and um, I decide to do a little research. And it turns out that yes, uh, my patient had been bitten by a pig. You know, normally I don't hear that that often. So I was, a, you know, as a micro enthusiast. Like, I was really excited, and that was the first time, and the last, actually, that I had one. With this, circling back to your selective media, you know, you have to be specific. Like I said, if you're answering what McConkie is for, selective for gram-negative rods, right? So you need to be specific, uh, because there are gram negative rods like Haemophilus or anaerobes that do not grow on McConkie. And you can actually lose points for that in your test. And not only that, you will be actually telling the wrong answer. Right? So just be careful uh, when you're going over these. And then we have differential media, which has ingredients that basically they allow some colonies to exhibit some characteristics that makes them different from other colonies growing on the same plate. We have two great examples. Blood agar, which is differential for hemolysis, right? And what is hemolysis, right? It's a lysis of red blood cells. And there are three types of hemolysis. You have alpha, you have beta, and you have gamma hemolysis. So alpha hemolysis is the partial lysis of the red blood cells in the agar, right? So it gives you a green color, greenish. Beta is complete lysis, so it makes you look clear. And then you have gamma, 
which is no hemolysis. So it stays the same. And another example is McConkie. And it's differential for lactose fermentation. So organisms that ferment lactose, right, they turn pink. And an example of um, enriched media, uh, besides the limb broth, is chocolate agar. And chocolate agar is basically heated blood agar. And then it releases, um, so then it makes both, it has both the X and V factors, which Haemophilus, you know, like Haemophilus influenza, uh, needs to grow. So that's why um, Haemophilus can grow in chocolate, but it cannot grow in blood agar. Right? Blood agar has the X factor, but it doesn't have the V factor. So that's what chocolate, you know, chocolate has both of them. And it also helps, you know, organisms like Neisseria gonorrhea uh, to grow better. And that brings us to the quiz time, right? So let's start with blood art. What kind of media is blood art? It is nutritive and it is differential for hemolysis. It is not selective. Gram-positive cocci, gram-positive rods, gram-negative rods, gram-negative cocobacilli, yeast they will grow on this agar so it is not selective but it is differential for hemolysis right this is when you can see that nice beta hemolysis of the group b group a beta hemolytic streps um that hemolysis that staph aureus produces you know you can see them you can see beautiful examples in this agar so it is differential and it is nutritive and what kind of media is McConkey? Well, McConkey is selective and it is differential. It is selective for gram-negative rods. Remember that distinction, not gram-negative. Gram-negative rods. So, it is not gram-negative. No, it is not selective for gram-negative. You know, my cereals do not grow on it. Anaerobes do not grow on it. Homophilus does not grow on it. Pastorella doesn't grow on it with the exception of erogenies. So not all gram-negative rods grow on it either. So, um, so it is selected for gram-negative rods and then it's differential for lactose fermentation, right? And you might keep wondering why does he keep repeating this over and over again? Well, let's just say that I have dabbed in teaching and I have gotten this answer a lot when I put when I ask which kind of media McConkey is, I get a lot of the selective for gram negative, and once again that's the wrong answer. So we already call you know. So the nutrients are in this agar that they need to grow, but what else do they need? Do they need anything else? Yes, right. You know they need oxygen and carbon dioxide. You know, as you know, most organisms are either aerobic, anaerobic, or facultative anaerobes, right? And actually, most of your classic pathogens, they are facultative anaerobes, which means that they grow aerobically, but they can also grow anaerobically. So that's why you have these incubators that have carbon dioxide um, to give that to the organisms so they can grow. And they also, right, they need the right temperature, right? That's why, you know, we catch infections. Organisms, they're like our, they like our body temperature. So these incubators, they're set, you know, to 35 to 37 degrees Celsius to mimic that temperature. In addition to the temperature, you know, they, you know, we need the correct pH. And, you know, the books show that most clinical bacteria, they, you know, they like a range of uh, 6.5 to 7.5. The media has buffers, you know, to make sure to maintain this pH. And they need moisture. So, you know, uh, they need water for certain metabolic pathways. And uh, even though the media has actually a lot of water in it, but when we put it in the CO2 incubators, you know, they start drying. 
So in order to keep that moisture, uh, you add water to the incubators. So if you're ever wondering why do I have to put water in the incubator, it's just so you can keep this moisture, right? So because, you know, the organisms need it. And that brings the question, so we have our media, right? And uh, how do we put those samples in the media? Uh, well, it all depends on, you know, depends on the source. Uh, basically, um, if you have, you know, like when they, you, know, you have a, a sore throat and they swab it. If you have a cut and they swab it. So you basically swab one portion of the agar. Um, if you have urine, you stick a, a loop in the urine sample. And then you put that on the agar. If you have body fluids, right, depending on the amount, you can... Um, you know, you, you centrifuge it and add some of that sediment to it. Um, so it just basically just depends on the source. And then which agar do we choose? So, you know, you can have a slight variation from lab to lab. Basically, they all have the same, you know, it's from the American Society of Microbiology. Uh, they create the standards for us. Um, so basically, your standard your standard culture has blood, charcoal, and McConkey, and then depending on some sources, you add like Martin Lewis that is a genital source. Uh, you tend to add abscesses and other. You add a PEA agar for that. Um, for urines, your 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 standards, you know, blood and McConkey. For blood cultures, you know, blood, chocolate, and McConkey, and depending on what you see, you add the extra plates. And then once we have the sample on the plates, you know, what do we do with it? Do we leave it like that? So, right, so you know the answer is no. I mean, we, it's going on. So we, by adding the sample, we inoculated it, and now we have to streak it, right? So with a loop, um, we streak and then there are two types of streaking. You have your isolation streaking, you know what they call the four quadrant. A lot of hospitals do the three quadrant. And then you have the quantitation streaking, you know, which is what the one that you use for your urine cultures. That's for some uh, quantitative bronch washes. So your isolation, right? So basically, you do for the four quadrant streak, right? So you see your plate, imagine. You know, like divided in four. So with your swab, you know, you, you inoculate your first quadrant, you add that drop of your fluids, and you stick that you know that that loop in your urine, and you do that, and then you basically start you know going from side to side on that first quadrant. And then you turn your plate, that's like about 90 degrees, a little bit less, and then you know bring your loop like from your first quadrant, you start making, you know, streaking that second quadrant. Making sure that at this point in time, you know, the space is not as crowded as in the first quadrant. And you repeat the same process twice. And the goal of this is that at the end, you know, you have some nice isolated colonies, right? And why do we need that? I mean, you have to keep in mind that our body's full of bacteria. Um, you can have infections with multiple organisms. So if you don't achieve isolation, you know, it's hard to get, you know, get that organism, um, you know, by itself. So you can do a proper ID. You can run susceptibilities on it. Um, also, you might miss an organism. You know, it's, it's very crowded sometimes, you know, depending on what kind of infection you have, especially if it's contaminated with the source, with the, the, based on the source. Uh, but you get like a lot of skin flora. You know, sometimes you have a patients that have these infections like on the foot. You know, with multiple gram-negative rods. So you want to achieve that isolation. It's very important. And then you have that quantitative culture. Right, so basically, you know, you use it for urines. You have a loop. You know, the loop, the head of the loop has a diameter of, uh, you know, you know, 0 0.001 um, millimeters. 
so then uh, you actually you dip your loop in the urine and then you do one line one vertical line and then start it from the top you now you go in a zigzagging pattern until you get to the bottom and basically depending on each colony you multiply by a thousand and the proper uh, format of um, proper reporting format it's colony forming units per milliliter right so if you have two colonies it will be 2000 cfu per ml you know 10 10000 cfu per ml and that's how you report urine cultures and then the question is you know how do you report your your isolation streaking you know um some places do like a one plus two plus three plus some other places do like occasional moderate heavy depending on the relation to the quadrant and that's how you you know you will report an, an isolation culture which is basically all your other cultures like i mentioned before your quantitation and you do urines uh bronc washes and then the other cultures you actually streak from isolation and the same way you know if, you, if you're trying to have more of a of a, a specific organism that you have in your plate it might be mixed you're trying to get it by itself you use that streaking that type of streaking the isolation one and then so you have your media you have your sample you have inoculated your sample you know you struck them they're ready to go to the incubator so they can start growing um normally you take a look at them after 18 hours but before you do that you have to actually prepare a gram stain right so this is the process of putting some of that sample on a slide and then you know using uh, some staining techniques you can you know look for white blood cells and organisms but that's what we'll be talking about on our next podcast and with that my dear audience we conclude episode one you know thank you everyone for listening you know and please continue your passion for what you do you know i was actually at a at a retirement party for a technologist that she worked 45 years in microbiology i mean such a great mind such a great worker uh, she was you know she is my mentor you know a friend i think i learned so much from her and um you know a, a founder of knowledge and then she said and this actually stayed with me she, you know she's like please continue your passion for what you do you know along my career i had some great experiences and um you know and some not so great but i you know it has been a wonderful journey and there are not that many of us uh you know all the ones in the group who were microbiologists uh there are not that many of us that are as passionate for this job anymore so please you know continue be passionate talk about micro you know find someone that's as passionate as you i don't know try to teach i think my journey it's i also had some great moments others not some great not so great um but definitely you know it has been a, a tremendous experience so keep up that passion you have a great week and i will see you next time with another episode of let's talk micro thank you everyone